Novak, everyone. So here we are back in the book of Zechariah at chapter seven. So Zechariah has had these visions. Now, these first eight chapters of Zechariah seems to be like part one. And we know exactly when they're written because it tells us when the king and which king it was. But then, of course, the last couple chapters or the last few chapters after chapter uh, nine forward, they all deal with something that happens later on in Zechariah's life. So we're going through these first set of visions now. And Zechariah continues to have future visions of Israel. So Israel's future has been described so far by Zechariah up to and including the judgment and the return of the Messiah. But Zechariah still has more to tell Israel from God. But the people, the people of Israel, they want to ask God a question. They have a question about whether they should continue to have these holidays, right? These sorrowful days, these mourning days that they have created. So that's where chapter 7 opens up is with the people coming to ask God a question. And chapter 7 and 8 is essentially God's response to the people through Zechariah. So we'll jump right into chapter 7, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Chislu. Remember, okay, at this point, there is no king in Israel. Ever since Jeconiah messed up, no king was allowed to reign. The only way a king could reign is if there was some child that was connected to the royal family, but not by blood. He had to be adopted. And that story is coming up on Christmas. We all know the story where this child is adopted by Joseph. But there is no king. So we're going to see every date that you give, whenever you look in this time, up to the time of the exile, all of the prophets dated themselves, those who did date themselves, they dated themselves based on the Jewish king. But here we see these Gentile kings. It was the fourth year of King Darius. Why would the Jew care about that? Because there is no king in Israel. Then you get verse 2 and 3. It says, When they had sent unto the house of, of God, Sherezer and Regimelech, and their men to pray before the Lord, and to speak unto the priests which were in the house of the Lord of hosts, and to the prophets, saying, Should I weep in the fifth month? separating myself as I have done these so many years. So here we got these people from Bethel, or they went to Bethel, the house of God. Their names were Sherezer and Regimelech, and they want to know, should we continue to celebrate or rather mourn and fast these holidays? So Sherezer, just as an interesting note, means prince of fire. Regimelech means friend of the king, or Regimelech, you know, I remember from Abimelech, my father is the king. Regimelech means my uh, friend is the king. So they wanted to know from the priests and the prophets, these authorities, spiritually, should we be weeping and mourning during this time? So in the, they want to know specifically about the fifth month, and we later learn about a few other fasts that they had. Now, the question is, why were they mourning? The people who are in Israel now, Israel has been given back to the Jews. Jerusalem has been given back to the Jews. The temples being rebuilt, the walls being rebuilt. Remember Ezra, Nehemiah, that's what they're tasked to do. We know that uh, Haggai, and we know that Zechariah is encouraging them as they're building all this up. So the question is, should we continue to mourn the fact that we lost all of this, particularly now that we have a lot of it back? Is this silly or should we continue to do it? Um, so all this, again, you got to keep in mind, though, all of this mourning and fasting that they were doing was man instituted. It wasn't commanded by God at all. God didn't say, OK, I want you to mourn this day, this day and this day. Right. So he said, so they're wanting to know what should we do here? And it's actually a good question. How many times do you even hear Christians today? And they're like, you know, should we celebrate this holiday? I mean, God, you never really told us to celebrate this holiday. Is it wrong of us? Is it right of us? Should we be remembering these things, even though it's not technically something you wanted us to do? It's a good question, honestly. So we get to verse four through six. He says, then came the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord of hosts unto me saying, because remember, he's one of the prophets. They came asking, they came unto me saying, speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests saying, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, 
even those 70 years, did you at all fast unto me, even to me? And when you did eat and when you did drink, did not ye eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? It's a pretty basic question. When you are celebrating these things, what is your attitude? What is the underlying drive for your celebration or your restrictions for your fastings? What is the reason you're doing it? Are you really doing it to honor God or is it for yourself, right? So just to keep us all on the same page here, the four fasts mentioned, there's, there's the fast of the fourth month, okay? That has to do with the fall of Jerusalem, when the walls of Jerusalem fell. So Jeremiah 39, 2 says, and in the 11th year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. So they would fast and mourn when they remembered when Jerusalem fell. Then in the fifth month, that's when the temple is lost. So in 2 Kings 25, verse 8 says, in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and he burnt the house of the Lord. And the king's house and the houses of Jerusalem and every great man's house he burnt with fire. So they would mourn the loss of the temple and the king's house. Then you get to the seventh month. There was someone left behind as the governor or the uh, vassal king of Jerusalem, and he actually is murdered. And that murder is talked about in Jeremiah 41, essentially the first, the majority of the chapter, actually. But in 2 Kings 25, uh, verse 25, it says, It came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama, of the seed royal, came and ten men with him and smote Gedaliah that he died and the Jews and the Chaldees that were with him at Mizpah. So the murder of the governor of Jerusalem. Um, and then in the 10th month, that's when Nebuchadnezzar had actually began the siege of Jerusalem. So all of these major events that led to the destruction and the overthrow of Jerusalem, they set up these holidays, these holidays to memorialize them, right? Uh, and that last one, sorry, that whenever the siege happened, Jeremiah 39, verse 1, it says, in the, nine, in the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the 10th month, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem. So all of these holidays, they were man-made rituals, and people were confused whether they should continue them or stop. The only fast ordained by God is which fast? Let me know which holiday, which feast day that was. The Day of Atonement, right. There was no other fast day. There were days where you might cut out certain foods, right? Feast of Unleavened Bread. Is that called a fast or a feast of unleavened bread? It's the feast of unleavened bread, right? So there were all kinds of feasts, but there was the day of atonement where you would actually fast. So God wants to know, what is the purpose of your holidays? You're asking my opinion as if they were mine. So are they mine? It's a really good question. When people say, what about Christmas? What about Easter? What about Halloween? What about all these different holidays? Like, well, wait a minute. What is, do these have anything to do with me? Right? What are the origins here? Are you truly seeking him? Do you use these days of celebration to praise God? Are you seeking his will? Are you doing his will? Or are you instead, you're doing it for yourself. Are you doing it to praise yourself? The main issue is not what you're doing. It's are you doing all things to the glory of God? When you work, you work to the glory of God. When you sleep, when you wake up in the morning, whenever you think, when you're, anything you do, when you go shopping, are you doing it to the glory of God? That's the real question. What is your purpose? What is the drive? What is the attitude behind your life? So God wants to know, what do we do? So the real question is, why do you do what you do? As a Christian or as a non-Christian, why, what is the purpose behind anything you do? Why do you do what you do? A lot of times we do what we do because we want to look good in front of others. We do what we do. We behave a certain way because we want to give people a certain impression of us, of who we are, of the fact that we're righteous, that we're good Christians. Hey, I'll see you in church on Sunday, right? I want, I want you to know I'm in church. Oh, I'd love to come, but I really need to spend time, you know, with my family, with my kids. And then they go to spend time with the family and the kids and they're sleeping on the couch right? What is your drive? Do you try to maybe make yourself feel better about certain things? 
a lot of times people, you know, they'll say, well, well, I was at least in church on Sunday. Oh, it's Easter. Oh, it's Christmas. I'll go to church this day because, you know, at least I'm getting in my religiousness, right? Why do you do what you do? Sometimes, you know, people provide God a lot of lip service as if God can be fooled, as if God can be mocked. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. That's a very clear message of the Bible. Nope. Yeah, absolutely. God require all the men to attend the feast. He didn't require the women. And it's perfect for the men to attend the feast. But for people to instruct <clears throat> them for the household. Mm -hmm. And how things are reversed today. Women go to church. You know, the men won't go, right? They're, they're not being the spiritual priests of the home. Yeah, yeah. We can see how a nation needs to fall. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take many generations. I think it was, uh, may have been Reagan that said, we're always one generation away from losing freedom. I'd say much more. We're one generation away of losing the religious fiber, the, the spiritual fiber of a nation or of a people. So the one thing we should all take away from this and it's a hard thing to not get trapped by. Christians should never perform anything for God out of duty or ritual. We are not here to be automatons. If God wanted us to, if his goal was for us to do everything systematically, regularly, all the time, you know what? My computer does that. Every time I double click on a program, it opens. We don't work out of duty and ritual. If we take communion, it's not because we're supposed to take communion. It's not doing it because, okay, it's the third Thursday of this month or the second Sunday or whatever your people do. The point is, no, we do it because we want to have communion, a relationship, a closeness with our Lord. And if somebody wanted to take communion every day, then take it every day. It's something that your desire to, to reach out and be with Christ, to be with others who are with Christ. This is something that shouldn't be out of ritual. What was that? Just said amen. Um, right. Well, I mean, we should be, we should look forward to remembering the sacrifice of our Lord, to remember the body that was broken, the blood that was shed for us. Yeah. And what about fasting? Sorry, did you have something? What, what, what I take from communion is that not only in remembering what he has done, but it's how reaffirming our commitment mm -hmm. to the covenant of what he's done. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. And the same thing with fasting, right? Do you fast because you're supposed to? If somebody can hand you a calendar and say, okay, these are the days we're fasting, well, maybe that's not exactly the spirit of fasting. It's not about a scheduled event such as these, where this is the time we are going to approach God more seriously. How about you fast when you no, you need to draw closer to God. Sometimes you get a phone call in the morning and fast from that phone call forward. Sometimes you just need to draw close to God. It's not out of ritual. It's not out of ritual. That should not be our drive. So it's also interesting to me, and I think Christians, just like Israel was uh, guilty of this back then, we are guilty of it today. We let the areas that should be the areas of joy in our lives become areas of burden. We, the Jewish people, they had turned the Sabbath, a day of rest, a day where they did not have to work. And as a matter of fact, we're told you will be punished if you work. Take a break. And they took this great day of rest and turned it into a burden. They actually dreaded the Sabbath coming. They couldn't do what they wanted to do. That wasn't the purpose of the Sabbath. What did Jesus say about the Sabbath? So the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's meant to be something for your benefit. Why are you taking something that should be your blessing and turning it into your burden? We do the same. We take things like prayer. And I've been guilty of this. Oh, my gosh, we didn't pray before the meal. Everyone stop. Spit that out. Spit that out right now. We haven't prayed. Are you kidding me? I mean, are you kidding me? It's okay to pause your meal to say, you know what? Let's thank God for this. This is amazing. But the point is, it's we should have an attitude of gratefulness. We should find ourselves praying constantly, not because we're required to, because we have so much to be thankful for, right? Um, 
when God is your priority, it's very easy to praise him. Whenever you see your need for him and see how much he provides for you, it's easy to praise him. That's why when you are sitting there at, in my case, 40 years old, and you're dealing with diabetes and glaucoma and blah, 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 blah. It's easy to get discouraged and say, oh, my gosh, you know, why do I have all these problems? But it's also easy to say, my gosh, I'm 40 years old and I have medicine and I have food around me and I have a house and I have a family and I have it. Why? What makes me any better than some of our brothers and sisters around the world who could dream of getting an ibuprofen? And that's something that we just have like six bottles of because we keep losing them. You know, this is something that we we have so much to be grateful for. But instead, we take what should be our rejoicing. It's Sunday. I get to go to church. Oh, it's Sunday. I got to get up early. Oh, my gosh. This preacher is going on forever. How about, man, this is awesome. I get, this is like a matinee. This is great. I get to, you know, I get to get, listen even longer. And it doesn't cost me a minute extra. Or it does cost me an hour extra. I'm coming back tonight. The point is, what is our drive? What is our priority? What is our goal? What do we look forward to? It's not a burden to serve God. No, the Christians are getting together. I can't wait. Shouldn't that be our attitude? So whatever you do, the main goal here is praise God. Praise God with whatever you do. When you speak to your spouse, praise God. He gave you that spouse. He joined you together. He made the two one. Make it a time to glorify God in how you talk. How about your children? Whenever you're raising your children, they're a gift from God, right? The Bible's very clear. Children are a gift from God. And sometimes we take that gift and turn it into a burden. And we're like, oh, are you kids? No, it's you kids. You drive me nuts, but I love you and praise God for you. And just grab them and hug them. When they're acting nuts, just grab them and hug them. Don't let them go. Until they start screaming and crying, like, can't breathe. Like, okay, you can go now. But the point is, praise God in all things. When you go to the supermarket, praise God. Use those as opportunities. Now, again, some people, and I'm not here to debate this, some people will say, we can't celebrate Christmas. We can't celebrate Easter. I don't care. I, I'm fine with celebrating. I don't see the problem. But I do know that whatever you're doing, are you doing it to praise God? Are you? Yes, there is no doubt. They have origins in paganism. But you know what? I see Paul going to the Greek temples to see the temple to the unknown God and using that to preach. Because you know what? I don't care where I am. I don't care what you celebrate. I don't care if you're celebrating Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or Christmas or whatever you celebrate. Let me tell you about my Jesus Christ and what he did for you. It's okay. You know what? If somebody got saved because of a Christmas play, I don't think God's going to say, sorry, he got saved the wrong way. You're going to need to go back. Use whatever opportunity God has given you, just like Paul did. Use whatever opportunity. I mean, a snake bites him and he uses it to preach. Okay. So use those opportunities to honor God. So, like that song, let me tell you, about my Jesus. you know, I've heard the title, but I've never actually heard the song. I love that. Is it a good song? Okay. Okay. Because I usually like the music. That's great. Um, And this even goes, by the way, for things that aren't necessarily Christian related. You think of these pagan holidays like Halloween. I mean, what other opportunity are you going to get where a bunch of kids are going to come to your house asking you for a gift? It's okay. Here's a piece of candy and here's a Bible track. So we always did. And me and Carly, we'd drop a Bible track. And and it's funny because you'd walk down the street. I'd hear the kids say, man, that house over there, they're giving out comic books. Used to give out those little comic tracks, right? The point is, I... You can have these, you can use things to praise God. You don't. We did the same. We, thanks to you, we've been doing this for Halloween also. The Bible tract? It, it, yeah, like what a better opportunity. Where else are you going to hand out 100 Bible tracts in half an hour? Well, we had one kid because had one of the um, million dollar Bible tracts and his kid was, Mom, I got a million dollars. And she goes, Well, that's good. You know, I'll pay the bill. <laughs> So we just pray over it, right? And just, or do you use it? Right. And and that's the thing. Right? Yeah. And that's a Christmas gift. If you're going to use that as an excuse to give a gift to your neighbors, mm-hmm. a box of cookies and a message of salvation is a one, if Christmas is the time to do it, so be it. And I celebrate Christmas. That's my view. 
So the real question is, what is your attitude? Keep in mind, it is, is it a joy for you to serve God or is it a burden for you to serve God? These people are coming to complain. Do we need to keep all these fasts? We're tired of keeping these fasts. Should we or shouldn't we, right? So it's interesting. God never directly answers their question, by the way, in these two chapters. He just says, where's your attitude? Live your life for God's glory. And it no longer makes a difference what it is you're doing because everything's to the glory of God. And then from 1 Corinthians, we already heard one quote from it, but in chapter 10, verse 23, he says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So what is it? Even if you can do something, is it being done to the glory of God? And then a few verses later in verse 31, he says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's your drive. You want to celebrate a holiday? Glory to God. You don't? Glory to God. Yes, ma'am. I just think, you know, what you're saying is uh, it sounds really, really good, but we're human, right? And there are times where I don't want to go to church, you know, and it's mm -hmm. just, but I think Satan is always, that spiritual battle is always there. And so <clears throat> you don't go be here because it's a duty, but a lot of times my attitude has to, I got to run to the Lord about my attitude. Oh, absolutely. Right. I'm just saying it's, and the best reminder is kids, though. The best reminder is kids. Because a lot of times my kids say, I don't want to go today. I say, oh, okay, I understand. But you're going anyway. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I got to tell myself that the same thing. Yeah. You know, oh, you don't want to go today? That's interesting. All right, tell me about it on the way. You know, yeah. and that's really where it comes down yeah, to because we are human. I was always blessed when mm -hmm. I pushed myself to get on Sunday night's church. It's cold. It's dark. I don't want to go on again. Mm -hmm. But every time I do, I'm I'm blessed. Yeah, know? absolutely. You have to push through that sometimes. You're absolutely correct. I agree 100%. All right. Well, that's enough for the first six verses. Let's go to verse seven. It says, should you not hear? So here's God's answer. He's like, should you not hear the words which the Lord has cried out by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity? And the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain? So his question, his answer, part of his answer is, there is no answer. Don't you see what they used to do? Go look at what would have happened had you guys listened when everything was great. You wouldn't even have those days of mourning. If you had obeyed the voice of God whenever you were still doing fine, they wouldn't have had to worry about Jerusalem being conquered. So, but he says, but you know what? I've already corrected you for those mistakes. I've corrected you and I've returned you to the land. So what essentially I feel the idea, the thought behind what he's saying is stop worrying about man-made rules. Stop worrying about religion. Stop worrying about the way they did it, the way their fathers in Babylon did it. He said, why don't you just go back to the way I told them before? What did I tell you guys before the fasts in the morning. Still follow the same rules. I am the same God. I still want the same things. I want your good. I want your salvation. I want you to treat each other good and be righteous and be gentle and loving to one another. That's what he's going to go through. So anytime we get concerned about the present, look to the past. As you look through the prophets and you look, remember, we've gone through almost all the minor prophets. But we can, does anybody remember how all the parallels we saw to the world today? When you go through all those prophets, you see all these things that happen. Why? What's the number one source of all this? Is that we are ungrateful people. We don't know how to be grateful. We don't know how to thank God for all that he's given us. So what do we do? We always want more and something beyond what God has given us. We always want to drive ourselves further and then talk about how we deserve it. And the fact is, we end up in the same shoes Israel was, in desolation and despair that we don't know what happened. What on earth happened? What is the biggest driving force in American politics today? It's about who's going to give me more. How much more can you need, America? Like, how much more can we possibly need? It's 30 degrees outside, and we're all sitting here nice and warm, and for what? What did you do to deserve a place this nice? It's, it really is amazing how ungrateful we are as a people. And I feel that it, we're following in those same footsteps. 
So now we look at verse eight through 10. He goes and he re reiterates what he told them way back when. And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah saying, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts saying, execute true judgment and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother. Remember, this is an almost a quote, exact quote from the previous prophets, right? Seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. So, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. Let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Same rules I gave you before, folks. Listen to him again. So the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies of heaven, he wants to remind the people of Israel their duty to each other. Show love, show compassion, seek the good of others over yourself. Be merciful. So help those that need help. Look for the benefit of others. Don't take advantage of others. But it's almost like people want the exact opposite. You got to look out for number one is the answer, right? Self-esteem, self-indulgence, self, 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 self. That's all we want. He's like, no, that's not who I am. You were made in my image. And guess why I do everything I do, God is speaking, is for you, is to give you, to bless you. That's my drive. That needs to be your drive. What kind of world would we live in if every man and woman looked for the good of other men and women? What kind of world would that be? I'll tell you shortly during the millennium, right? It's going to be cool. But uh, the point is, how different is that? Jesus tells us in the New Testament, how are people going to know that you belong to me? Because of the way you love one another. That's the big drive. That's the thing that's going to tell the world that you are mine. So are those values being emphasized today in the world? Love for others, or is it more self-glorification? That seems to be our main focus. But what happens if you don't listen? Um now, it's also important to remember that as Christians, we do have a tendency to be hypocritical, and the world notices that, right? Um, let me ask just a kind of a random question out there. Let's say somebody goes to the supermarket, and you pick up a box of mac and cheese. And I don't know how much mac and cheese costs, but let's just say it costs 25 cents. So you find it on the shelf, and there's a clear sign underneath it, mac and cheese, 25 cents. And you go up to the count to the checkout counter. And it comes up as two bucks and 50 cents. What would you do? Oh, hey, what, what have you done? This is not right. It said 25 cents back there, right? And you'd get it corrected. You'd bring up their problem and say, you know, you got to fix this. Now you went back up five minutes later and bought, you know, you needed a couple more. So you went back and got it. And it came up as 2.5 cents. Everyone, I'm sure when I ask right now, will say, oh, I'd fix that. What would most people do in that situation? Oh, no, well, just keep on moving. You know? uh, 2.5 cents, 5 cents for two, two uh, boxes. Now, there are a select few that actually would try to correct that. But the point is, do you execute true judgment? Do, do we, and I'm not trying to say we should be legalistic. I'm not saying that everything we do has to be exactly perfect, which we should drive for that. We should strive for that. But the point is, we can often be hypocritical when things benefit us. We'll let things slide when they benefit us. We'll be okay with people doing certain things when they benefit us. That's not true judgment. That's frankly corruption. That's where corruption starts is when something benefits us. And I think the other thing that we really should pay attention to is that very last part of verse 10. Let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. I cannot tell you not that me and my wife ever argue, because how can you argue when someone's always right? But the point is, the, the point is, have you ever had that argument where you have this discussion with someone and then next thing you know, you replay that entire argument and you actually, you know, voice out what you were going to, what you should have said or what you would say if they said this? Surely, you know, I'm not the only one that's done that. So the point being, when we replay scenarios where we're going to figure, we're going to tell them what's up, what are you doing? A, the conversations never go that way. And B, what are you doing? What is the goal? What is this practice for? To prove yourself right over that person, to show them how wrong they are? You're literally planning out and devising bad things for that person, evil things, wicked thoughts. The Bible says, do not 
imagine evil against your brothers or sisters. You know, when you try to make a case against someone in your head, you will always win. And your view of them will never be the same. So whenever you disagree with your pastor, whenever you disagree with your brother, when you ever disagree with anyone, and then you play out in your mind, next thing you know, you no longer have that same relationship that you used to have. Instead, when you disagree, it's okay to disagree. It's okay to correct one another and sharpen one another, but doing so in love, not imagining evil, not taking this. We hear what people say, and if you want to guarantee a stress-filled life of misery and suffering, always assume the worst about what someone told you. If you want to have a time of love and happiness and just joy, always assume the best. When my mom says, clean that up, and yes, my mom still tells me that. I'm 40 years old. She still tells me that. Clean that up. I can either assume that she's just being an overbearing, you know, annoying, why are you doing this, mom? Or I can assume that, wow, she really wants the best for me. She's doing that because she doesn't want anyone to look at me and say, wow, that's messy or anything like that. <laughs> when people talk to you, are you assuming their best intentions or their worst intentions? And I think that oftentimes as Christians, especially as Christians, we may have more of a, a negative view of us, especially when their views are different than our own. We look at other denominations and we're like, oh, well, look how, look how they've totally misinterpreted and everything. And then it gets to the point that when you meet someone from that denomination, you discount everything they say. You have no interest in what they have to say. You know that their whole philosophy is wrong. Whereas really you disagree about maybe two verses or something like that. Just always keep, especially those within the family of God, Always seek good for them. Think of good for them. Don't imagine evil on them. And that's just my bit of advice from maybe personal experience, and I don't think it's a good thing. I think we need to turn those things around. So then we finish off chapter 7 with verses 11 through 14. It says, but they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. These are all the people before the exile. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts hath sent by in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it came to pass that as he cried, they would not hear. So they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them, that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. So the people had refused the word of God from the former prophets, the previous prophets, and they brought upon themselves the wrath of God. When they finally did decide, oh my gosh, we really made a mistake, and they cried out, guess what? The ark was already shut. It's done. You had your chance. You missed it. Same thing's going to happen one day. One day, the door's going to shut to salvation. Today is the day of salvation. If you're not saved, you better get there. Don't wait. Don't say, okay, when I turn this age, I'm going to do it. You don't know if you'll have tomorrow. So the promised land was lost to Israel for a while, right? It was lost. The people were carried away as captives. They were dispersed between Assyria and Babylon. And what about today? How does that relate to us today? The same problem. God's calling out to the whole world. For those who don't know him, come and find salvation. He's calling out through his prophets. Who is prophesying today? It's the church. What are we prophesying? What Jesus told us to say. Today is the day of salvation. Come and find Jesus Christ. That is the message that God has to say. Come now, and if you don't, it may be too late. But so many people, they harden their own hearts. Just like he says here, like an adamant stone. They do not want to believe it. They will not hear it. They want nothing to do with it. And one day, they're going to, it's going to be too late. They're going to close their eyes in this life, and they're going to open them in a place of suffering where they will spend an eternity. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's a scary thing. It's a scary thing. You know, one day there's going to be a rapture. Regardless what view you take, there's going to be a rapture at some point. And the church is going to be gone. And you're going to have this whole world in a place without God's Spirit trying to draw you in you're going to have to seek him. And it's going to be much more difficult to seek him at that time. And at the end of that tribulation, 
And at the end of that millennial reign, anyone who's chosen to reject Christ will forever be cast into a lake of fire. Forever and forever and forever. And he's calling everyone. But just like Israel, those former people, they rejected that message. So many have rejected the message today. I think many will be saved during the tribulation. And many will be saved during the millennium. But we also know many will be lost. Many will reject that gift of Christ. So I hope that your heart is not like an adamant stone. But the Bible says, I will take this heart of stone and I'll give you a heart of flesh. He'll give you that heart transplant you need if you would just accept him as your savior. So I hope that you learn the lesson that the former Israelites didn't learn. I hope you learn through their desolation. He said, because of them, the land is desolate. Do you know that I know a lot of Christians who feel desolate? They feel discontent. They'll go to church. They'll be with Christians and they'll just feel like, I just, I'm just unhappy. I don't have anything. I don't have any joy. What is the problem? Sometimes I say, well, I got to do more devotionals. I got to do more prayer time. Got to go to more Bible studies. Got to go to more church. You know, sometimes the answer is just loving others, showing compassion, getting out and seeking the will of others more than yourself, going out and doing good for others, just as Jesus commanded us to. Paul, he had his share of sufferings in the world. Peter had his share of sufferings in the world. What was their main role? We can call them apostles, but that's a Christian term. What can we say? We say they were servants. They were always working and worrying about others. I mean, the guy's in jail on death row waiting to die. And what's he in a rush to do? Not write his own dissertation on why he should be released. Let me tell you guys how to correct all the issues in the church for when I'm gone. He cared about others more than he cared about himself. And hopefully we've learned that same lesson. The issue for Israel was not a lack of fasting. It was a lack of love and compassion and the right attitude towards God. And that ends chapter 7.